Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Oh Shoot. I am your host, Casty Lynn. Welcome to another episode. Um, I'm currently recording and Appa is on my lap and like walking all around. So <laughs> this will be interesting. I I can't be like that bad person and put him on the floor because he's just too cute. So we'll just, we'll see how this goes. Anywho, thank you guys for being here. If you are a new listener, my dog's name is Appa, by the way, if you don't know. But if you're a new listener, hi, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I record these podcasts on YouTube, so you can watch on YouTube right now this episode and put a face with my voice. But if you don't want to, that's fine. You're here. And speaking of being here, I just got back from New York. And this is going to be like my little portion where I do life updates because I try to do a guest interview one week. And then the next week, I try to do just like a solo episode and update you guys on everything. So that's what I'm going to be doing right now. So if you don't care, then skip ahead. But I just got back from New York. Um, We actually shot in New Jersey for a wedding on Friday, then went to Long Island Saturday for two sessions. And then Sunday I drove to Pennsylvania for a wedding. So it was a lot, but um, yeah. And then we flew back on Monday morning at like 5 a.m., but we had to get up at like three. So it was very, very crazy, but we just got back from that. I swear I'm still catching up on sleep from that. I am like so tired from it. It's just, it was a lot. Um, so yeah, just got back doing good. Obviously have lots and lots of shoots. Basically busy season snuck up on me so quickly. Like it came out of nowhere. One second I was chilling in April, didn't have anything. It was just editing a little bit, you know, doing some fun personal sessions. Boom. I've got weddings every weekend, two weddings a weekend. I've got shoots every single week, multiple shoots. Like, I don't really know how this happened, but here we are. So busy season is here. And would it be busy season without a trip to Europe? I think not. And that's where I'm going next, people. That is my next big trip. We are going to Europe in July. So we booked an elopement in Ireland and I don't mean to offend anyone that lives in Ireland or any of those areas around, but I literally cannot ever get straight Ireland, Scotland, and Iceland. I think it's just their names. Like I just, the names confuse me. So we're going there for an elopement and then we are going to Paris and I think I might have a session or two lined up there. And then we're going to Switzerland because Charlie has family there and then we are driving home. (laughs) We're not driving home. We are flying home. Oh my gosh. We could not drive home. So that's going to be fun. I have about a month until that trip. So I definitely am going to probably do like an international travel podcast episode and give you guys the lowdown on what it's like to travel internationally, but also get paid to do it and like all that stuff. Um, yeah, I think one of the things I did want to say was, you should be outsourcing your editing if you are at the point where you're not able to meet your deadlines. And I just very briefly want to say like, do yourself a favor, save yourself some time and honestly, like just some mental space and send your editing off to people. You don't have to necessarily do every single wedding or every single session, but just think about it because I don't know, it's definitely worth it. I love outsourcing and I think it saves me time to work on other things besides just like editing all the time. Um, okay. Last thing that I wanted to say, we are working on our house. So today I'm recording this later in the day that I wanted to, because we had plumbers here all day long. Like, I'm not kidding you. It sounded like, I don't even know, like chainsaw massacre in here because they were like, tearing apart our bathroom, like this tub that we have, but it was like ceramic, I guess. So they had to like chop it up and then move it out. So it literally sounded so loud here. So I could not record my episode until right now. Um, and we're also working on our pool because I want a hot girl summer, even though I'm literally working all summer, I still want to have my hot, hot girl summer at the pool. So those 
are my life updates. Wow. That was a lot. Um, I recently, I think it was like two days ago, found out that I am on a preferred vendor list and I didn't even know it. Like this venue that I've worked at before, they have me on their preferred vendor list and I had no idea. Like this venue, I was like getting tons and tons of inquiries from them. And I just figured like, you know, I've shot there before. Like maybe these people are seeing my photos from a blog post or something. I don't know. Or like that one person that I shot there is referring me to literally every single person they know. But then this person, t- not today, yesterday maybe, reached out and said that they found me because this venue referred me. So I have never spoken with any person that manages the venue. I've never, um, you know, no coordinators. I've literally never spoken to anyone face to face or even. I don't even think on social media either. I've never DM'd them or anything before. Um, I've shot there at least like three times and never have I come across like an owner or anything like that. So it was a very, very random. And I wanted to just kind of talk about how I think I got on this preferred vendor list. So a few of the things that I've done with this specific venue, because my goal when I started doing photography where I live was to get on this venue's preferred vendor list, but I'm not the type of person to like go and ask, like, I hate doing that. So I wanted to be like the best vendor ever. So then they would refer me. So one of the things I did was, um, I've shot there before obviously. Um, also anything I post at their venue, I always tag their account. So yeah, I always tag their account on any posts or stories that I do of this venue, which I think is important. Um, I also posted a reel a while ago, just being like, here's this venue. It's super awesome. It's in Grand Rapids, you know, whatever. I just was like showing photos that I've shot there basically. And I honestly think that on top of like shooting there kind of frequently, like I have a lot of weddings there this year as well. I think that might've impacted how I got on this list. Honestly, I'm not like completely sure how I got in this preferred vendor list, but I do think like being intentional with stories and posts and just like being a good vendor when you do shoot there I really think that does make an impact on whether or not a venue will put you on their list or not. So it's just something to think about, but I was genuinely shocked when this person was like, the venue has been referring you. I'm like, what? Like me? (laughs) Like what? So yeah, crazy, crazy times people. The last thing that I wanted to say, I just have a lot of thoughts today. Like, I don't know. I just, as I was like, touching up my makeup for this episode, I literally like, I just have a lot to say. I was thinking of a million things to say while I was touching up my makeup. So yeah, you guys are hearing them right now. (laughs) Um, This has to do with viral videos. And this is just a little tidbit of just something that I've learned recently. There, in order to go viral, you kind of have to have one video that has gone viral in the past. So obviously like if you haven't had a video that's blown up before, you have to do that first. Um, But the concept of going viral after you've already gone viral is quite simple. And it's honestly sad that it's this simple because it's like, I don't know, it kind of feels like it's cheating the system. But once you have a concept that does well, recreating that same concept and literally having that same concept in a video talking about the same thing, but just wearing a different outfit and posting it like a month later, like it will almost guaranteed go viral. Like if you're going viral for the content of the video, not, and like you're not going viral for like the sound you're using, then this concept is going to work well for you. So there is one video that I have redone a concept for, four times at this point, I would say like literally I've done it for, and I'm, I'm thinking about redoing it again. So I'm on my fifth time every single time I post it, it, it goes nuts on TikTok and on Instagram. So there are these concepts. And once you have this concept that does well and performs well, recreate it. And a lot of people on TikTok do this, which 
like I said, feels like it's cheating the system, but hey, if it works, it works. So that is the end of my random, random stuff that I wanted to talk about. And I feel like I kind of do that random stuff because it's like, if you learn nothing else from like the actual content of today's episode, at least you can learn from my little tidbits of things that I think of throughout the week. And there are things that aren't worth a whole podcast episode, but they're worth, you know, two minutes of the episode. So today we are talking about posing. Yes. And posing is something that I've wanted to talk about on here for a while. I've done podcast interviews like with other guests and they've talked about their posing techniques and all of that stuff. But I kind of wanted to talk about it from my perspective and how I do posing because, I mean, I do think that posing is a big thing and a big issue that a lot of people have. A lot of people struggle with posing. So I just wanted to break it down for you guys as simply as I can, talk you through my process, and hopefully you learn something from it. This posing technique and how I do posing works for not only couples, but also like just one person as well. So if you're sitting here being like, oh, this episode isn't going to apply to me, it will apply to you because this isn't just for like couples. Although obviously I am a couples photographer, so I am going to talk about some things related to capturing couples. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is prompting versus posing. And this is a really important thing to talk about within photography because Prompting is one thing and posing is another. And personally, I think you need to have a healthy balance of both in order to get the best result. That's just my opinion. Um, I think if you just do prompting, it's going to take you longer to get the result. And I don't do like two, three hour sessions. My sessions are like an hour at the most, like an hour and a half at the most. So that's why I do a mix of posing and prompting. If you are just doing posing, I feel like you could get through everything in literally 15 minutes and you're done. So let's talk about the difference between the two. So when you are prompting a couple or prompting your subject, you are exactly how it sounds, prompting them. You're telling them not exactly like do this with your face, do this with your hands. You're just giving them a general direction. You're saying like, walk away from me and then walk back towards me, giving them room to creatively express themselves and show their natural faces and however they would normally look. Versus if you're posing, an example of that would be walk away from me. But while you walk, I want you to look at me and smile and hold it right there. Got my shot. All right, now keep walking. And then you have them stop and then you have them walk back towards you and you say, walk and hold hands and smile. And then they do it for like three steps and then that's it. Um, I find that posing is a lot more stiff, but prompting is a lot more fluid. So I do a mix of posing and prompting basically. When you pose, you're telling someone exactly what to do with their hands and their face and their legs and everything. And like you're controlling every single aspect of it. Um, But I think there's there's a really cool part of prompting where you're getting natural, candid reactions out of people. You're getting like movements that they normally do and faces that they normally make versus in posing, you are telling them exactly how to do their face and everything. So I like to do a mix because I do think that giving someone absolutely no direction isn't always the best solution when you prompt because if you just kind of tell someone, oh, go go off over there and hug. I don't necessarily think that you're getting the best image unless like, that is exactly what you pictured in your head. I think posing helps you with achieving the look that you're going for but prompting helps you keep it feel candid and natural. So what I do, so the example of walking, I would personally do, you know, walk, walk away from me and then walk back towards me while you guys walk towards me, swing your arms, look at each other, smile, you know, push each other back and forth, things like that. So I'm telling them kind of what to do, but I'm also giving them room to do different options. So I'm saying like, you can push each other back and forth. You can just hold each other and swing your arms. Like 
I'm giving them options so then it doesn't feel as like posed as the first example that I gave. So I think that when you prompt, you do this to get movement-based photos. And I think the best movement-based photos are based on prompts. So telling someone like, I don't know. So telling a couple like stand far apart. And then when I say three, I want you to um, pick her up and spin her around like you haven't seen her in five years. Okay. Um, sometimes prompting can get cheesy. Literally. Um, the example that I give people is I have been posed by photographers before who do more of like a prompting thing. And I kind of think it's weird as the subject. Um, so someone once told me to like whisper something specific in Charlie's ear and instead of doing it, I just was like, oh, this is kind of weird. And then he laughed and that was the reaction that the photographer captured. So you kind of have to find the right people to do prompting because I, I don't think I'm the right person to prompt. Like as if I were the subject, I'm not really the right person to prompt. I like when someone tells me where to put my hands and kind of gives me a little bit more freedom. But then when it comes to posing, um, I think you should pose when you're getting more classic shots. So when you are getting like the classic, like stand there with your arms around each other, look at me and smile, like that's a classic photo that you get. And you, you kind of want to pose that one. Or if you're doing some like specific shots of their rings, if it's a couple like putting their hands in a specific place, you know, that, that would be a good time to pose when you prompt. I think it's really good to prompt for movement based stuff. If you want more candid reactions and that's why I do both. I would say probably the first part of my sessions are usually, usually <laughs> I said, usually <laughs> the first part of my sessions are usually more pose based because I want to make sure I get like the classic shots that I need. And then I'll use the last half of my session to do more fun prompting movement based stuff because I do think both of those things are important for my style. So that's prompting versus posing movement versus stills. It's very, very similar. I pose with a lot of movement, but I do have a few still poses that I use. So when I'm doing my still poses, that's usually when I'm giving a little bit more direction on like, so I'll have them face each other and I'll be like, squish your cheeks together and then look at me and give me like a really cheesy smile. Like that's a pose. But then what, if I want a little bit more movement, that's when I'm doing the prompting stuff of like, um, come up behind her and act like, um, you're at a party and you guys are just hanging out and you just want to come up to him and talk to him. I don't know. Like that, that would be more of a prompt where they can kind of take it whatever direction that they want. And that gives you a little bit more movement too, because you're telling them like, come up behind this person and do this. It's the difference between prompting and posing is like giving them more of a scenario and like putting the pose into real life versus just telling someone do this. So the prompt would be act like you're at a bonfire and come up and give them a kiss on the cheek and give them a big hug from behind versus the pose would be put your arms around them and kiss them on the face. Right? So there's a difference between the two and there's a different emotion that comes with that because when you are just giving the pose, that's a little bit more stiff and it feels a little bit more like robotic at that point. You know what I mean? I'm, you guys can't see me, but I'm literally like moving my arms around like I'm a robot. So now let's talk about, um, I don't know, just body position that I, this is something that I did want to talk about. Um, I, I first do want to mention that posing takes time. Um, you can't get better at posing if you never try it. And as you pose more frequently, the more natural it becomes like anything else. Right? So if you are feeling discouraged about posing, maybe you feel like you always forget your pose. Maybe you feel like you never know what pose to do next. Just know it takes time to get good at posing, but frequency is going to help you. Practice is going to help you. So the less you pick up your camera, the more you're hurting yourself when it comes to posing. So try posing, try it often and try different poses, try different techniques, see what sticks, see what you like when you go to edit them, see what you vibe with. And 
take mental notes of those things. So then when you do show up to a session, take, take note of the fact that you didn't like this pose you did before, but you like this one a little bit better or whatever. So posing takes time. Like anything, it takes time to become an expert. Um, I read this book one time and I think it was called like 10,000 hours or something. I think. And basically it said it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything. It literally is scientifically proven that it takes 10,000 hours. So with photography, it's the same concept. If you've only spent like five hours doing photography or like, let's say you do photography like three times a week. So maybe three hours a week, you need to keep working at it because your hour count scientifically is going, you're going to get better the higher your hour count is. So practice, practice makes perfect. Let's talk about body position because I kind of just went off on a tangent there. With body position, when it comes to posing, think about what direction your subjects are facing or your single subject, whatever. If you're posing one person, if you're posing six people, what direction are their bodies facing? You also want to think, Think about their hands and their face as well. So when I'm doing posing, not prompting, but if I'm just doing posing, I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to have them, my couple turn in and face each other within that pose of turn in and face each other. I can do 20 variations of different hands and faces. So I can have my couple put their hands around each other's waist and then look at each other and smile. And then I can have them turn towards me, smush their cheeks together and smile. That's a completely different pose. And I can get so many different shots just from that different pose. And then I can have them move their hands around. Maybe I have them play with each other's hands at that point. Maybe I have them bump noses with each other. Maybe I have um, one of them kiss up and down their cheek. When you are thinking about body position, think about how many poses and how many variations can I get within this one body position and within this one direction that they're facing and then focus on, you know, the hands and the face and everything else to help you achieve those different variations. Um, I am a big fan of literally like the four body positions that there are. Literally, it's just like, you facing me. Okay. And then it's like face each other. Great. And then it's like both facing me, but like one of the persons stacked behind the other person, or like maybe they're both back to back, you know, there, there are all these different directions that their bodies can face. And then you can do all of those same directions sitting. Right. So there you have it. Like within just standing positions and then them going and sitting and doing the same thing, but just sitting now, you can get so many variations of a pose and you can get so many different shots to help you get to that number of like, okay, I have enough photos. I could leave this session and be fine. Now I'm going to go and do creative poses and do some more fun things. So let's talk about candid feeling photos. The way that I like to get a candid feel is by giving people like a sequence of events to do over and over. And I think, um, Bailey Dennis actually talked about this on the podcast episode that she was on. She basically said that she'll give people tons of like tasks to do when it comes to posing. So then it feels really candid because they they have to like stop and think about what they're doing or they're just doing a bunch of stuff. And then it kind of turns into this big, like jamble of like a bunch of poses and they're just smiling and like acting crazy because they don't know what they're doing. So an example would be like, walk away from me. And as you walk away from me, like push, push and pull each other's arms and then stop, do a twirl and then come back towards me and then do like a sushi roll dance move into, um, their arms and then hug each other and sway back and forth and then walk towards me while you hug each other and sway back and forth. So that's a lot to remember. Okay. Obviously. So when you give someone a sequence of poses, you are giving them too much to think about and they're just going to kind of try to do their own thing. They're going to make it their own. So that part where I was saying like, uh, do the sushi roll into each other's arms, they might do that completely different than another couple might. So that's kind of their chance to kind of give it their own spin, like give the pose their own spin. You can't expect to be perfectly inspired by just going through poses on Pinterest before a session. That is the least creative thing that you can do for your brain. 
yes, Pinterest is helpful, but when you are using Pinterest as a template for your session is when we start to have some issues when it comes to creativity. Um, I love using Pinterest to give me ideas for body position and just like fun things to do at the location that I'm shooting. So I love to use Pinterest for like, um, I'll look up like beach engagement photos or if I'm shooting by a mountain, I'll do mountain engagement photos or, um, you know, mountaintop wedding or something like that where I can just see what people have done before. And then it kind of sparks ideas for me as I look through different Pinterest poses, but it's when you are, you know, screenshotting things from Pinterest and then pulling out your phone and looking at those poses during a session that it's hurting your creativity and it's hurting your posing in the long run because you're not allowing yourself the opportunity to grow and think for yourself, you're allowing someone else to think for you. So I would challenge you to use Pinterest, but use it very wisely and with discernment because the more you rely on Pinterest, the less you're going to grow as a photographer who can pose. And you want to create a natural feel with your posing, at least I do. So a lot of the photos that we like on Pinterest are the ones that feel really candid, right? And the reason they feel candid is because that was very specific to that moment. And you trying to recreate someone else's candid emotional moment, like that's not how it works. Like you need to have those own emotional moments within your session that are unique to that couple because that's what you like on Pinterest, right? So trying to recreate a candid moment on Pinterest is like trying to like copy and paste someone's relationship, which you can't do because every relationship is different. So remember, Pinterest is not always the best solution when it comes to posing. So use it carefully. Another thing that I want to say is know your poses and do the poses that you like frequently. Um, A lot of people will approach posing as I did this pose last session, so I'm not going to do it again this session. And they'll be like, oh, I feel like I do the same thing at every single session. I'm so bored of the same thing. If you know what works when it comes to posing, why try to fix it? Why fix what's not broken? The way that I like to approach posing is doing my classic signature kind of stiff poses at the beginning of my session And then I'll do movement stuff after, or I'll do a good mix. Um, You know, I don't always do movement at the end, but I like to do things that I know work at the beginning. So then I know like, okay, I got the shots I need. Like if I can't get any other poses out of this session, I'm good with the poses I need. So I'll do my five poses that I do every single time. And then I'll do a few movement poses. And then at that point, I know that I could leave the session and be perfectly content with the photos that I got. But because we have a little bit of extra time, I'm going to do creative poses. I'm going to try back to back. We're going to try sitting on each other's shoulders. We're going to try laying down. I'm going to have you go swim in the water. I don't know. Like I'm going to have you do creative stuff because that's where you start to see like your artistic side come out. And that's when you really start to have fun with it. So another thing is remembering that every client is different. Every person's different. So if one client is better at a serious face and one client is better at laughing and looking more like happy candid versus like stoic candid, take advantage of what they're good at. Obviously you want to do like a little mix of both like serious and smiling stuff. But if one client is just so happy like why try to make them serious? Literally this wedding that I shot a couple weekends ago, I told them to do a serious face and literally neither of them could. And I was like, okay, they're happy. I'm not going to try to make them look sad when they're obviously happy. So I'm just going to keep doing happy poses because they're happy, right? So do, do what works best for your client for sure. However they feel comfortable, just roll with that. I think it's also important to remember that it's not bad to do classic poses. So it's not bad to do like put your arms around each other and look at me and smile because you need some classic photos. You know, that's what grandma looks for. That's what mom wants to print and put on her wall. So I do it just for that sake. I think having just one or two classic photos, like that's awesome. You're you're at least checking the box of like, okay, we have a classic wedding photo, then get into more of your style and get into like 
more, you know, candid stuff or whatever your style is, get into more like moody poses or whatever it is. Start with at least like a few classic poses. Um, and that works for seniors as well or um, families. Like I always start with just put your arms around each other and look at me and smile. Or if it's a senior, just look at me and smile because that is the stuff that like at the end of the day, most of the people are going to like that photo a lot. And obviously your other movement poses are very creative and they're fun. And that's probably what your client's looking for. But when it comes to like family members too, like those classic poses are important. So that's just a little thing to remember. I want to leave this episode by challenging you with this thought. So if you can do the same five poses at every session, let's say it's walking, Let's say one is facing each other. One is the prom pose um, back to back. And then let's say one is the piggyback. Okay. So those are five poses. If you can get at least 10 unique shots with each of those poses, 10 might be a stretch, but I want you to think about getting a wide shot, getting a landscape wide shot, um, getting a close up. Um, getting like a mid shot, turning to the side, maybe just getting one person or get turning to the other side. If you can try to get at least 10 unique shots per pose, and that's five poses, you are golden because you already have 50 images at that point. And let's say you promise 75 images. Okay. Then you just do some fun, creative stuff and you get up to 25 poses. Um, I love the interview that I did with Larkin Kendall because she basically said that she directs all of her sessions as if it's a movie. So she literally will tell people to do the same thing over and over again, and then she'll get different poses and she'll get different, not different poses. She'll get different angles. She basically does the same thing over and over again and like redoes it so that she can make sure she's getting all the shots that she wants. But because she's doing a little bit more movement based, it is a little bit more like directing at that point. Um, and that's, that's what I do too. Behind the camera, I am like telling people like walk towards, like walk towards me. Okay. Now like turn and look at each other all I'm shooting. And then I'll be like, all right, give her a spin. Literally all the stuff I'm telling them with the camera in front of my face, because at the end of the day, as I'm looking through my camera, I'm going to see what I think the next thing should be like naturally. And that's, that's the thing when you're using movement poses, it feels like naturally there are next steps to each pose, you know? So walking maybe turns into a spin, which maybe turns into like a bear hug, which turns into kisses on the face, which then turns into like turn them turning in towards each other. Like it's just a natural flow. And I think as you do it more, you'll kind of get, get that flow and kind of figure it out a little bit. All right. So I've talked long enough about posing. I don't know if any of that made sense, like literally, but I hope you guys, you know, learned something from this. And I hope that this was a good explanation of how I do posing. Like I said, I pretty much do the same thing for families, for couples, for individuals. Um, I start with kind of classic, normal, like pose type of things. And then I move into prompting. So I hope you guys learned something from today's episode. Like always make sure you go follow me on Instagram. That's where basically I post my whole life. That's where everything is. Um, so my Instagram is at Cassidy Lynn, always linked in the description of the episode. I also have TikTok at Cassidy Lynn photo. And lastly, I would love for you guys to leave me a review. You can rate and review me on Spotify or Apple podcasts either, or, but yeah, that is it. Thank you guys so much for being here on today's episode. I hope you liked it and stay tuned for next Monday for a new episode. All right, guys, have a great rest of your day. Expose my mind to clarity. Oh, my spirit shudders. Capture the moment or keep my sanity. The wisdom rushing in. So much clearer now Getting a little bit higher With every step I take I'm getting good Getting a little bit better I'm climbing to the top Never gonna stop I'm